cage and we're going to find them. Now get going! 101 Dalmatians is the most modern Disney animated movie ever made. The one that has the most guts, that says this is art, but it's entertainment at the same time. 101 Dalmatians was a huge influence on me. I liked the look of it, I liked the story, I liked the characters. There was something just very kind of fresh and novel. What's he going to do, Dad? Let's just wait and see, huh? One thing that sets the movie apart from a lot of movies in the Disney canon is it's a contemporary story made to play in that time period. And the cool thing about it is that it's contemporary to this day. It's contemporary in a classical way. 101 Dalmatians was the first Disney animated film that was more than just fantasy. It was a mystery, there was suspense, you were worried about whether these characters were going to come through. I'll skin every one of them little spotted eyes if it's the last thing I do. Also, we had the new technology. The Xerox process was going to replace the old ink and paint. So that was exciting. So you see in 101 Dalmatians, very mature animators doing probably some of the best work of their lives. And yet you see Walt Disney almost mourning the fact that he has to let go of this beautiful romantic style that he loved in favor of a simpler style that's representative of mid 20th century art. It's not your usual children book illustration come to life. It's Picasso coming into Disney. Still, our hearts are touched. And I'm very, very lucky that I was part of something so wonderful. Smith published her story, The 101 Dalmatians, in 1956. The story was inspired by the fact that she herself had Dalmatian dogs, the first of which was called Pongo, and a friend of hers, quite casually, and not maliciously as Cruella de Vil might have said, that, um, yes, those dogs would make rather a good coat. And the story immediately caught Walt Disney's imagination. This was a time of great growth at the studio, and Walt Disney was so involved in other things, he had television, the theme parks, that animation got a little less of, of Walt's time. And so he put into effect this idea of taking a very strong story guy, Bill Peet, and basically having him lead in this feature film. Now, Bill Peet came to Disney in 1937. Jobs were scarce, and he heard that Disney was looking for artists. So he came and he started working as an in-betweener. Which meant you were way down the line. You assist with the final drawings of the characters. It was the grunt work. It was the bottom rung of the ladder. It really frustrated him to no end. But Bill was really driven and knew he wanted to be a story person. And when he got his chances, like on Dumbo, some amazing scenes in Dumbo when the little elephant's getting a bath and his mother is bathing him. It was beautifully drawn, no dialogue, and beautifully laid out by Bill Peet. And then later, you know, his work is seen in pretty much every Disney movie. And he became this very senior story person. A lot of people don't even know what story men are because uh, the work that they do is never seen on the screen. But before any animation is done, it's all storyboarded. It's kind of like a comic strip, which tell the story sequentially uh, from cut to cut. When we did movies like um, Lion King or Beauty and the Beast or Aladdin, we had 15 people on the story crew. Bill Pete did it by himself. I had a chance to go to the archives and look at his story sketches and compare them one after the other and you follow these sketches and you go well i'll be this is impossible they didn't change a thing this is exactly the way bill pete had envisioned it he missed him oh thunder's pretending i think bill pete was a master storyteller and he structured this story to make it a story that is so focused so controlled so centered on these two dogs and their quest to get their puppies back that you follow the story with an effortlessness and I think they tightened it in a way that really works. So much so, in fact, that Dodie Smith wrote to Bill Pete and said that he had, in fact, improved on her book, which is uh, quite a compliment when you think about it. And he was able to put flesh on the bones of what was in that children's book and create the characters that we know today. And the way the characters interact in it or have a very Bill Pete sort of touch, kind of uh, modern sensibility to it. It's one of the things that makes that movie very unique is, is, is how contemporary it was. That was the first time where here's a married couple that clearly is physical toward each other and there's a flirtation going on when, you know, he's pulling her around and going, Cruella, Cruella, DeVille, I, you know, I love that. 
These are characters we hadn't seen in a Disney film before. Cruella de Vil smokes cigarettes. The dogs watch television. It was something very of the moment. And I think that was a great departure, not only story-wise, but stylistically for Walt. I mean, we were all very excited about it. And mainly because it was so different. You know, it was so different from what had been done at Disney before. It really broke new ground for Disney's animation department. <laughs> 101 Dalmatians was groundbreaking. It's really the first Disney animated feature that isn't really a musical in any way. It's interesting that, uh, that Dalmatians has so few songs in it. It's a real break with what had just come at the Disney studio. And it's ironic because Roger's vocation is songwriter. You'd think that would be an excuse to have a lot of great Disney songs. It just shows you how Walt Disney was never any kind of a slave to any formula, even if it worked well before. The songs in 101 Dalmatians, they were written by Mel Levin. And though the song Cruella de Vil is the most memorable song from the movie. Mel Levin actually wrote a song prior to this one for Cruella. Now every night I almost go insane I hear those witches chanting in my brain Cruel, cruel, Cruella, devil, devil, devil Cruel, cruel, Cruella, devil, devil, devil But driving to work one day, Mel thought, you know, a blues tempo would, would really fit that character. So he came up with that melody line, so he replaced his prior song himself. You come to realize you've seen her kind of eyes watching you from underneath a rock. The last song was a Dalmatian Plantation was, was exchanged because Bill Pete wanted a different version of it. Bill Pete wanted to end the movie with a song that emphasized rhymes and so he asked Mel to replace the song he had written. With all of our remuneration our station seems truly sublime At my occupation I'll find inspiration With no application to time So Dalmatian Plantation number one was replaced by Dalmatian Plantation number two Dalmatian Mel wrote Canine Crunchies as an absolute spoof of current commercials on television, taking it as far as he could to its silliness. But there are not so many songs in 101 Dalmatians, but there, there is a lot of musical feeling in the film. And George Brunson's score is very much a soundscape to which the film played. He really deserves uh, great respect. He tells the story with his music, starting with the opening credits. When it says 101 Dalmatians, his score goes... And of course, later in the movie, when Cruella shows up and, and starts to notice that all the Labradors in the scene might be Dalmatians. He writes this incredibly suspenseful cue that echoes the water drops coming off of the roof. It was the first time Disney actually did a feature that was not set in the world of, of classic or fairy tale. So it's a contemporary score because it's a contemporary film. It wasn't the traditional orchestral score. It was a more jazzy thing. It was really clicking into the current sensibilities in many different ways, which is quite different for a Disney film. Well, for years, uh, Disney films had been inked and painted by hand. Sleeping Beauty, was the end of an era in many ways. And it was the last hand-inked, hand-painted film. Now, Disney animation, as most people know, the, the animators draw in pencil, and then it went to uh, the inking and painting department. Which meant you took an animator's drawing, put cells over the top of the drawing, clear plastic sheets, and hand-traced it with multiple colors. So Aurora in Sleeping Beauty would have this beautiful yellow line around her hair, and she'd have this fleshy line around her face, and her lips would even be a separate ink color. It was so difficult, and then you, you would watch these girls and they couldn't put their hand down on it because they would smear the ink. 
and they would do these wonderful sweeps and follow the line just so. It was marvelous to watch them work. They were really exquisite at what they did. And then it would be turned over and, and painted, and that becomes the cell that you see on screen. It's very laborious, very time-consuming, and expensive. Following Sleeping Beauty, the studio was in a real difficult situation. Sleeping Beauty hadn't made very much money. It had cost a fortune, and Disney was desperately trying to cut back. Here's the studio that was built by animation and was maybe getting priced out of the animation business. People were always saying to Walt, forget about the animation. You know, you're in television now. You're making live action movies. You've got a theme park. But Walt Disney had to make animated films because that's what he did, but how to do it cheaper. Ub Iwerks uh, was Walt's perhaps oldest friend. He had uh, been Walt's first business partner back in 1922 in Kansas City when Walt started Laughograms. And Ub was the man who animated Mickey Mouse in Plain Crazy and Galloping Gaucho and Steamboat Willie. He was also a mechanical genius. Of Iwerks invented a lot of things which were of vast importance for the studio, like uh, the multiplane camera, which gave depth to the films, like the sodium screen process to be able to marry together the elements in live action and animation elements, like you see, for instance, in Mary Poppins. Well, my dad, of Iwerks, got to thinking about how could we save some money? And one of the things that occurred to him is that the Xerox process, which they were coming out with these little copiers on the market, that maybe he could transfer an image onto a cell as opposed to a piece of paper. So he went out and did some experimenting, and it seemed to work fine. So the Xerox process, pretty simple, operates like your average office copier. Except in those days, uh, the Xerox machine they used took up three rooms. You'd have a lens and an electrostatically charged plate, and the lens would take a picture of the drawing and transfer it to that plate. Uh, the plate would get dipped in toner, and then the toner would be transferred to a clear cell. We started using it sneakily in uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty, and it was in the dragon sequence. <laughs> Thou sword of truth, fly swift and sure, that evil die and good endure. I wanted to do a test case to see how Xerox would work and how it would look on the screen. So they tried it out on a short called Goliath 2. Oh, show ya, Pop! Xerox didn't cut the quality of the animation. They didn't do limited animation. It's still a fully animated film. The acting is still there. It's still subtle. And it worked fine. So it gave, gave everybody confidence uh, that, hey, we could do this with Xerox. I think it must have been awful at the time to be a, a, an inker at, at the Disney Studios when Xerox something because you were out of a job all of a sudden. And I think it was the best ink and paint department that ever existed on this earth. And I cried when they closed it down. I think we did lose something because the Xerox line lacked the subtlety of the ink line, which was incredible. But on the other hand, it was the gaining of the quality of the animator's drawings, especially in the way it was done in this film. Don't you dare go up there, you, you big long leg lummox! So I guess one could debate those points back and forth, you know. Was Xerox a, a step forward or a step backwards? Over the next 50 years, uh, the Xerox process didn't go away. It became a very, not only cost-effective way to make animated films, but also became more sophisticated. You could begin to use color Xerox lines later, uh, and eventually it was uh, you know, supplanted with a computer which could use complete color lines, which got back to the look of the original inked movies. So again, Dalmatians becomes a real crossroads of technology meets art in a very, very clever way. The Xerox work worked well with the uh, Dalmatians because they were black and white. You just needed a very easy outline of them, you know. There's a correlation between the characters themselves being Dalmatians that are, are black and white, and then the very strong black lines of the Xerox process that was used to transfer the animator's drawings onto cells. 
The animators loved the process because rather than passing through the hands of other people to interpret their line drawings, they were finally seeing what was on their drawing board put up on the screen. Well, we were delighted. Uh, the Xerox process was a delight, really, for the animator, at least uh, we felt one time, because this is the first time we ever saw our drawings directly onto the screen. You old rascal! There was apparently an inner office memo that went around at Disney saying, please make your drawings neat. Don't show your construction, your, your roughs underneath there, because whatever those drawings are are going to go right onto the screen. So the assistants had to go through and clean up the drawings. And of course, this must have been really nerve-wracking. If you were working for someone really great, you know, Frank Thomas or Milt Call, who had done these amazing drawings, and then you have to go with your own pencil and mess with it. Milt Call became militant about the people following them up, reducing the rough lines. Uh, Milt uh, made them kind of stay away from that. So in some Milt Call scenes, you actually start to see glimpses of construction lines. I I've heard stories of Milt Call exploding because somebody changed his drawings. And as time went on, Milt was able to hold on more and more to his exact drawing. Several of the nine old men worked on 101 Dalmatians. Wolfgang Reitherman, who later was to direct The Sword in the Stone and then The Jungle Book, directed The Twilight Bark, one of the most magical scenes in the film. Humans have tried everything. Now it's up to us dogs. The Twilight Bark. A sound alert! <laughs> one of the first dogs that picks up on the Twilight Bark alert is this little Scottish terrier, and it's Jock from Lady and the Tramp. And the first moment you see him, it's the original cleaned up drawing, which was then inked and painted. Then he transitions into a little bit more of the rougher, looser styling. And we pass along and we see a pet shop. And in the pet shop are Bull and Peg from Lady and the Tramp. And just before the scene leaves, Lady comes into the picture. So it's really fun to look for. Wooly was famous for reusing footage. He would reuse anything. In fact, everybody was aghast when he wound up using Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in the dance sequence in Robin Hood. And it was like, oh my god, you wouldn't. It's not done extensively in this, but, but Wooly was very proud of his knowledge of old Disney animation and how it might apply within the context of a new production. The other animators that worked on 101 Dalmatians were some very famous people. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston worked on the dogs. Frank did an amazing scene where the little puppy um, is stillborn. And that's um, incredible subtle animation. Look, Pongo. There's a scene which uh, Ollie Johnson often talked about, which was where uh, Padita hides from Cruella de Vil under a stove in the kitchen. And the whole scene is conducted with Padita in the corner. She can scarcely move. It's wonderful animation. So it was very restrictive as far as action. You couldn't move her head much or anything, but in the end, I think that was the best way to handle the sequence. Oh, Pongo. And uh, what moves we did put on them, I think, paid off, and particularly the little one at the end where he gives her that little kiss. <laughs> We've always felt that touching was very important in animation, and taking these little pencil drawings and having them touch has a big impact on the audience if it's done right. And we called it uh, Anita and Roger. Actually, uh, Anita had actually been done by somebody else and he was in the picture for a while and Walt looked at it and said, uh, we gotta redesign her. And who did they give it to? Milt, of course. Milt just got a design and he just sat there and he just did it and it was perfect. I like to think that Anita was really based on me. If you see pictures of me posing, you will see Anita. You know, as you did a line, and the natural way that you projected, they really watched you do that, and you could see it in the character. Oh, Roger, you were magnificent, darling. I mean, I know I keep on saying it's tea time, Roger, but it's that one line that when I do it, I see the inclination of my head. Roger, dear, tea time. <laughs>
I see the way I do it in the movie. Straighter, attractive heroine, Milk got that job a lot because they had to be drawn really, really well, but you could never exaggerate too much. They had to be handled very straight. Take mine. <laughs> you can do anything you want with animals. Because we're doing animals doing things that animals don't do. For instance, facial expressions and dialogue, everything. And uh, people aren't used to watching animals doing this, and that, so, that, so they're not critical. But uh, they're used to watching people that move around and talk and every, you know do everything, and and, uh, and they become very very critical of them, you know. This was another scene that really grabbed my attention as a kid. It's another milk call scene. It's just this beautiful arc that, that he does with the hands. It's like a ballet almost, you know, a fumbling with this pipe. Daddy boy. And then you have Corolla Deville. What a great character and everything about her just fires on all cylinders. Mark Davis is genius at drawing Cruella Deville. Police are everywhere. I want the job done tonight. <laughs> this was uh, really the one of the most fun assignments I've, I've ever had in the studio. She was uh, a funny villainess. Well, what she was doing wasn't very nice. She herself was an entertaining character. <laughs> Anita, you're such a wit. This also happens to be the last animation that I ever did on a Disney film. Mark Davis, of course, was known for not only designing Cruella de Vil, but also single-handedly animated her throughout the film. Dalmatians is influential to everybody that, that works as an animator now. It's such a great combination of real knowledge in terms of human, motion, emotion, animal, anatomy, locomotion. I mean, these guys are really at the top of their game. You know, this crew, this Milk, Carl, Frank, Ollie. It's just so well crafted that the animators just kind of go crazy over it. Everything you see, the faces, the characters, the, the way they were drawn, it is so incredibly beautiful. It's, it's art. It's truly art. You know, the, the way the cars are animated in the movie is so funny because they have personalities. The way the horse of Jasper's van sort of rattles when it comes around the corner, it just has as much character as they do. Ub Iwerks had this interesting idea that, okay, so I'm using a Xerox camera to translate pencil lines drawn on paper into line work on cells. Why can't I have that camera look at a line that's drawn on the edge of a model? So what they did was actually built a car out of cardboard and put black lines along all the edges. And to make the wheels articulate, they would take a long piece of cloth and tape little pieces of wooden doweling underneath it and then put the car on top of the cloth, suspend it from a kite string, and then pull this long piece of fabric with all these pieces of wooden doweling underneath the wheels, and they would shoot a take of that. Because they put the springs in there, the, the thing would, would, would have this little rumbling and so forth. Those film clips then were transferred directly to a Xerox plate. They were painted, and what you see on the screen in Cruella's car is that model zipping around, and it's pretty darn cool. <laughs> Idiots. You know, think of the digital paradigm today, the way we can, you know, study movement and study uh, three-dimensional objects. Well, we were doing that in a very crude way with these model cars, but it worked, you know, and, and it worked very well, you know. I look back on it now, and for the time, it was a really neat idea. There's a scene when Cruella actually goes off the bridge into the ravine towards the end of the movie, and her car is struggling to get up to the side of the hill done kind of the same way. They had the model of the car and they covered this uh, kind of model hillside with sand, shot it all in slow motion, and the snow, in this case the sand in the scene, would start to slip back down the bank. And uh, that's what you see in the film. So that process of shooting the live models with that black outline was something that was really forged during those days of 101 Dalmatians. It's a really clever idea. It was an idea to save money in part, but it's an incredible effect when you look at it. And those vehicles are so cool even to this day. We also had a unit actually that did just the spots. Chuck G. 
Jones said uh, only Disney would animate uh, a movie called 101 Dalmatians with like 6 million spots. He said at Warner Brothers, we, we couldn't even do a movie with a dog named Spot that had one spot. So uh, it, was, it was a pretty crazy idea to do 101 Dalmatians. You, know, you have all these statistics that the puppies had 32 spots and Pongo had 76 and Pretty had, I think, 69 or something like that. It adds a lot of work to do this. So a crew had to go and actually draw all that. And uh, it was uh, completely insane. 101 Dalmatians starts right off from the very beginning and plays with the idea of the spot. Let's face it, if you're going to stylize a dog, what dog's more stylized than a Dalmatian? I mean, it's practically a 60s magazine illustrator's version of a dog. The opening credits were very elaborate, and those spots, you know, bling, 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 all around. It was a great opening for a picture. You'll find all these puns about spots. The spots will be smoke coming out of a, a passing trawler. Um, spots will become musical notes because it involves a songwriter and, you know, what is music but spots on a page. It's just this very whimsical title sequence that automatically shows you the animators are in a playful mood and that you're going to have a visually delightful film. I just think it's one of the greatest things ever done. Xerox process was designed somewhat to save money, but for whatever reason, and I don't actually know um, if it was planned or not, I think this whole Xerox process was perfect for this story and this movie. It sprung partially out of necessity, but it made the, it forced them to make a lot of really good choices, and I give the lion's share of that credit to Ken Anderson for that. Ken Anderson was a design genius, going all the way back to the Silly Symphonies. He had his big breakthrough on Ferdinand the Bull. He just had certain ideas of how they should be painted and it was a little bit more involved than some of the earlier Silly Symphonies. And the overall art director said, Walt is gonna hate this. We never had uh, colorful backgrounds like this. But Walt loved those backgrounds. Ken Anderson in 101 Dalmatians brought a whole different look, very angular and abstract. It's very modern in its look. It was the first use of uh of uh, Xerox line on uh, any kind of feature picture. And I personally loved the idea of seeing an animation drawing in Xerox. So then I tried to make it one world by doing the same thing with the backgrounds. What Ken was looking for was a design that would bring the backgrounds and the animation together. And if I've seen some of the backgrounds in there, these wonderful layouts, which are fairly, uh, uh, what would you say, traditionally drawn and a guy named Ernie Nordley went over the backgrounds and made uh, you know, perfect uh, symmetrical things a little bit asymmetrical and, and uh, fattened some things up and gave it a little more of a caricatured quality. It's a subtle effect. His drawings were then Xeroxed and placed over the background painting to bring it all together and make it all feel like it had the same graphic quality of the foreground characters. Anita, darling, how are you? Miserable, darling, as usual, perfectly wretched. In one of the early shots of 101 Dalmatians, when Pongo is sitting on the window seat, there's a little magazine there, and people may not know today what it means, it was called Lilliput, and it featured the work of all kinds of graphic artists of the 1950s and 60s. It's not by chance that Lilliput's in that scene, because that is the style of this film. I say, now there's a fancy breed. And Ken Anderson worked really closely with a guy named Walt Paragoy, who's a really um, opinionated, strong, uh, fantastic artist. Walt's fine art paintings are highly collectible and desirable out in the art market right now. Walt Paragoy would put these blotches of color on that would loosely represent uh, a doorway or loosely represent a couch. There's something very sophisticated about using the impression of a shape to be where your color is defined. While it looks simpler, it's actually very hard to do well. And Walt Paragoy had a real knack 
for that. And I think Ken Anderson recognized that in Paraguay and let him go to town. His personality was, was so off the wall that he couldn't be, be confined to painting very neat, precise images. And that's what came out in his work. Ken Anderson said I was the guy that was going to do style. And Ken knew me. And nobody tells me what to do. <laughs> If I wanted to wipe out a line, I'd wipe out a line. Nobody controlled what the finished product because the backgrounds were mine. And I think what Ken Anderson, Walt Paragoy gave us with Dalmatians really fit that story. <laughs> and I think it's a great looking film. And then we find out, much to our surprise, that Walt was not all that pleased with it. And poor Ken Anderson, uh, boy, he, he's, he really suffered for that film because I think having Walt being displeased with your work was probably the, the worst thing that could happen to any Disney artist. Well, I'm a huge fan of Ken Anderson. He's been kind of my hero from the beginning of the time that I started to work in animation. It's almost tragic that Walt Disney actually did not like the look of the film. What's the matter with you two? You got cloth ears? I said you're not coming in here! <gasps> It's ironic because we see it as a masterpiece of art direction. And I think Walt was a romantic. I know he really loved the style of the Peter Pans and the Cinderella's and the Snow Whites and Pinocchios. And I think Walt probably mourned the fact that he was losing this lush, beautiful tapestry kind of look to his films. And Walt Disney uh, it never quite forgave Ken until the very end of his life. Walt came into the studio and I was so grateful and glad to see him. I said, gee, it's good to see you, Walt. He said, Ken, it's sure good to be here. And then he looked at me and uh, penetratingly with the eyes and I knew that he was forgiving me for this, this uh, thing I had done on the Dalmatians. He didn't say anything, but I know I was forgiven. That, uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, it wasn't so bad after all. So it meant, it meant a lot to me. And then I found out, of course, two weeks later he was gone. Audiences love Dalmatians, and critics love Dalmatians. They found it unpretentious, and it got among some of the best reviews of any Disney feature since Dumbo. They're all here, the little dears. It's a miracle. Oh, Roger, what a wonderful Christmas present. We look at it now, we wouldn't want it any other way. It's the way it should be. 101 Dalmatians was enormously successful, so in that sense I think it really kind of helped the medium through a kind of a, a difficult period. There was something just very fresh about it that, that got people excited again. Sometimes you, you can take the medium for granted, especially with the excellent work that was done film after film after film, and then sometimes something new comes along and, and kind of reinvigorates things, and I think 101 Dalmatians did that. I love Dalmatians, personally. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. I thought it was a great picture. I really did. Dalmatians seemed to be the right film at the right time, and it just pushed the studio forward in a new direction. And it was, it was great being there, and it was great working on that film. And it was great watching all of this, you know, happen, you know, right before you. It was, it was, uh, it was a great time. It's part of my life, and I didn't realize the degree of the magic that I was involved in at the time I made the movie. I'm very, very lucky to have that. I feel like it is a legacy that I was part of something so wonderful. 101 Dalmatians remains, you know, even though it's 40 years later, it still it remains as contemporary as it ever was. It's one of the most casual and lighthearted of all the Disney movies. And I think that's one of the things that makes it so entertaining decade after decade and for decades to come. I'm sure my grandchildren will be watching this movie and delighting in it the way I did when I was two and it was brand new. So uh, it, it's nice to know that it goes on and on.